updating. Uh, yeah, uh, so thanks for having us actually, uh, Vladimir uh, Mikhev and uh, myself. We are um, researchers at the uh, University of Stuttgart. They're actually in an institute, which is called Institute for Visualization and Interactive Systems, so I'm quite fitting to Marty. But um, as I said, we are not uh, actually visualization people, but we are uh, neuroscientists or cognitive scientists. So we mostly work on statistical data. Uh, we work on like brain potentials or so EG data, eye tracking, this kind of uh, more quantitative things. Uh, I know you can't see my beautiful uh, slides, <laughs> but I'm going to start. Uh, with introducing EEG a little bit, uh, I was asked to, to give like a, a little bit an insight into the field. What are we using Marty for? Why do we need it? And uh, in uh, some sense, uh, we are also discussing a little bit of visualization things. So we did the survey and, and EEG experts, um, and uh, we will show you a little bit the problems uh, that you have if you visualize EEG data, um, like that are a little bit more specific to it, but might also generalize to your own uh, uh, domains. And finally, uh, we will discuss all the like, yeah, Marty stuff that we did and uh, that I think uh, worked quite nicely and are fun. And uh, um, we will specifically go into some of the issues that we had uh, doing with this. So well, I guess we call it now. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, the issues are quite small compared to what we can actually do in Marty. So that's, that's very nice. Okay. Zoom has updated and it's trying to connect. No, I don't need computer radio yet. I found all the stuff here. Okay, uh, cool. So, uh, and let's have a small interaction. So this is an uh, EG tab. We are using it to measure brain potential differences across the whole skull. And as you can see, there's a spatial formation of that. But uh, for most of the data, we are just looking at uh, like it's in a big array. So you're measuring this and you're measuring it with uh, like a uh, thousand Hertz. So once per millisecond or so, you get this super squiggly line. So each of the lines is one of these electrodes, right? And uh, yeah, this is how we read your brain. Uh, fun fact, if you're ever in a lie detector, just clench your teeth really hard. There will be nothing in the EG left because muscles also produce electrical potentials. A uh, very neat trick if you uh, work for KGB or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> they probably are aware of it. Okay, so we are, uh, what we are, but what we are actually doing as scientists, we have some kind of experiment. So we know in time when I present you a house and I present your face, and I want to understand what is the brain doing differently when you perceive something as a house or as a face. So then you show this, you know exactly in time when you present stuff. Um, so you have the continuous EG and you know these time points. And because you can't really see anything from these uh, squiggly lines, what you do is you average and you try to get rid of everything else that the brain is doing at the same time, like the daydreaming or those kind of things that are annoying for the researchers. So we cut it and we just average it and we get really beautiful uh, marky plots uh, in this case here. Uh, we can color code, let's say, like these are, just to explain, this is the time now from the stimulus onset in this case here. This is like the voltage difference that you get. And each of the curve here is one of the electrodes, as you can see here, visualized, like mapped from the 3D head to a 2D space. In this case, and we call it a butterfly plot because it's a little bit like a butterfly having wings. Right? So this is like the classical approach that everybody's doing for the last 70 years or so. Uh, we are not doing any fancy 3D brain uh, visualization, something like that. They're super hard. Uh, and I'm not using Maki for that yet. <laughs> but um, what we are doing is uh, we are stepping up a little bit instead of just taking averages. We are now taking uh, using so-called regression ERP. So we are what we basically do, let's imagine here again, you have the uh, uh, same time to an event, but now we have each of the single trial. And instead of just averaging them, we are, we are calculating a regression for one time point. We save the parameters, let's say we have two parameters here, could be continuous, categorical, variables, variables whatever. Uh, and then you just slide it over uh, in time and you get this uh, kind of similar curves that we saw on the uh, previous slide. This is now for a single channel here. And then you would just save this, repeat it for all the channels. And you get like big matrices uh, for all of your uh, data that you then would analyze. 
Uh, and with that, I already come to the challenges. Uh, if you have this now, what, what did we gain? Um, maybe we got something like this, or this is maybe where we started out. So we had time, we had senders, like I showed you this matrix, but then we also have many trials, or later after the regression, we would have many predictors that we could look at various ways. For those of you who do uh, linear modeling or like but regression background, you know how complicated it is to already look at the single uh, regression model if it has uh, enough of linear or continuous effects or so. Yeah, in, like imagine that over time and space. It's really tricky. And on top of that, of course, uh, this is just the EG of this guy here. Uh, we have other people coming to lab. This one's very good, has no hair. Very easy to put the EG together. And uh, we have many others. So and uh, it turns out, you can see in, in, in the slides or so, the, the, there's a huge variability between people how this looks like. So we have to somehow look at this uh, thing. One way you can think of it, and that's uh, often the other way, this is just like a, you can call it a tensor, or just a, a, a four-dimensional uh, big array, which has like 100 uh, sensors, a thousand time points, maybe 2,500 tries, something like that that's realistic. Uh, and uh, 40 subjects also a typical value for a well-powered study. So then, yeah, this is what we're investigating. This is what we are trying to visualize in some sense. Okay. So uh, if you take this cube, there are multiple ways that you could slice and dice and select um, uh, uh, these kind of things. So popular, one popular, I already showed you one popular visualization. This is kind of butterfly plot where you basically select one of the predictors and you have, a, uh, you select all the time points. So you, this is time here. And you have a little bit of spatial information in the sense that you plot all the, all the channels, but you actually lost all the spatial uh, information where is one channel relation to the other one. So another one is where you uh, another one would be where you actually plot all of the uh, spatial one, but you don't plot all of the temporal one, which is uh, then called uh, the topo plot. You previously saw one uh, um, in Simon's talk uh, here, where you basically project down the three D position of the electrodes into a two D hat, and so you're kind of looking from the top. Uh, you're looking down on this the subject, and that allows you to see oh all the Negative uh, values here, they are actually on one side of the head and the positive ones are on the other side of the head, which you can see from this, from this display here. And then you have a trial problem, you have more, more of these cubes, you have always more dimensions. And uh, so, for instance, you would have the same cube and you just have the uncertainty information. So, how, like, how sure am I that this curve is here or not? Uh, something like this. So, what you could do, you could just add more of these double blots and then you can try to map the the uncertainty and all this uh, can, a little bit of hacks in some sense or so, but it's a really hard problem and nobody in my field at least knows how to really combine uh, uh, these estimates with the, with the uncertainty. So you could plot like standard deviations or p-values or something like this. Who knows? These are actually not done with much. Uh, <laughs> well, coming to that. And other ways uh, you could again have time, but then just select one of the senders that makes your life much easier because then you can principally just have one line and you then you can show all the senders. So here, here in this case, we're um, a kind of oh, we're kind of showing um, uh, several predictors at the same time. So again, zero would be onset, and now we have a predictor with four different values actually evaluated. So it's like a marginal effect. So we'll come to that in a second. Um, so that's one way that you can do it for a single electrode. This is already again hard. So if you want to train uh, or investigate multiple electrodes, so you need to know where to look. Uh, you need to have explored the data already. Showing uncertainty here is already like, should I add five arrow ribbons here? Or like, how should this is already like, we don't know. Um, but what you can do, you can make a simplified even more. <laughs> you simplify time as well. So now you just look at the single plot basically uh, of this. So each line here would be different subjects um, in this case. And you could, now I could add an arrow bar here because finally I only look at, uh, at the predictor here and on the one on the x-axis. Not entirely correct here because it's just one predictor. I have determined they have 10 or 15 or something like that. And they have even interactions, very complicated things. Uh, you probably not do that. Okay, so uncertainty visualization, what people are typically doing. Again, one of these, uh, we call them ELPs. Um, that we have here, one way is you can just add the variability of each subject and you can see each of these lines is like one subject and you can see they are quite different. Uh, only in the average, they are the same, so that's nice. So if you get a new group of 20 uh, people, you get the same average, but the individuals are very different. Um, and you can add this kind of error bars. The trouble of doing something like this is that you're actually not interested in what's the um, variability of each subject, like how sure am I that this line is here? But you're actually interested in 
I'll show you, I mean, that the subject has a difference between the lines. So typically, you always try to subtract things because then, if you do that, all those main big movements are all kinds of like incentives. So you could also uh, look at the differences. You could show this main curves here and then just show the difference wave here and then circle in a different way. And uh, if there would be a nice toolbox that allows you to do stuff like this easily, yeah, that would be a huge win for uh, EG. Uh, right now, you have to do this all by hand. There's no like proper pipeline way or something to do, to do something like that. Um, yeah. Finally, um, before we uh, like in the introduction, this, this R in R ERP makes your life really hard. Uh, so if you have a, a relatively simple model where you have like an interlinear model, this is now for people who know a little bit of linear modeling. So uh, uh, you have like an intercept that's true for all of your uh, trials. You have maybe a condition effect and continuous effect. Right? You would get this kind of parameters that are resolved in time. So for instance, this one, this is intercept, it's true for all. This one would be condition effect. So if I would now want to know if I switch the condition from one level to another, I would need to take this intercept plus the condition. So this is positive. So, okay, so it would be a little bit like something somewhere around here, right? I can already still imagine that. If you're untrained, it's really hard to see from immediately from just the coefficients. And then finally, you have this, uh, this uh, green parameter, which is a continuous, uh, it's like a slope, like you all know from linear regression, or uh, you fit a line and it has a slope, right? So the, um, it doesn't really help you if I say the slope is 0 0.5 or 1 or something like that, you, because it also depends on what kind of data do you put in. Is your data range from minus 1 to 1, or is it, for, um, is it like noise in percent from 0 to 100? That really is important to, uh, to identify uh, what are these values. So one way that you can do it, you can take all these parameters and you just plug in the actual value that you observed or some specific grid of values that you want to look at. And you can get what we call marginal effects, a little bit simplified. But there I could just put in, oh, I want the condition on the level, what is it, car and phase in this case, and the continuous variable just the same, should be same for all trials, and then I get this kind of plots. Or I could put in like continuous variables here. And that just um, let, let it, uh, give give me out all the curves uh, that depend on it. Um, yeah, just like looking at all those these things, you have to do manually. So you have to specify it manually, then you have to update the plot or make a new plot. You have and this is just for one channel. There's no real way that we don't have a good way to to um, make this fast, make like to just explore the space. In the end of the paper, you would show just one of these plots maybe because then you know where to look. But coming to that point, I think it's it's really challenging, and I think. I think we really need new tools uh, to do that, um, especially if the models get more complicated and, and larger. And uh, potentially we need new tools with uh, interactivity. We need new tools uh, that allow to do some kind of animations. Um, what's super important, I guess, is uh, to have that we have reproducibility because you know, scientists after all, so if you just have a GUI kicking around, that's gonna be a little bit tricky. Speed is uh, nice as always, we don't want to wait. 10 seconds if you click somewhere, interactivity, modularity would also be nice. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, all those kind of things. That's what we thought. But then actually, we don't know. So <laughs> uh, we are happy that we are, uh, could join this uh, SFP on um, uh, visual computing that's going on in Stuttgart. Um, uh, and we have a project there where we are trying to uh, do exactly that, like build a new tool. And I guess the first thing that you need to do if you want to build a new tool, you actually need to find out what should the tool actually have. And uh, this is where Vladimir comes in. He's a, a doctoral researcher in this SFP, uh, and he will show you the survey. One, one. Okay, my name is Vladimir, and now I will talk about our user study. So uh, we wanted to create a new tool, but before we need to create, we need to uh, conduct a user study. So actually we did that. Uh, and uh, we started our uh, survey at the end of January, and for now we have already uh, 190 participants. They are mostly Europeans, uh, and the typical uh, per, um, typical participant of our study is usually a uh, doctoral or postdoctoral researcher. Of course, we also have some professors. Of course, it's, uh, this image is quite biased, but uh, the survey is ongoing. So 
uh, the link is working. And if you know some EG researcher, I don't know who is a bachelor, uh, who is a medical uh, uh, in medical field and lives somewhere in Brasilia. So feel share, feel free to share with him about this survey. Uh, okay, so uh, what uh, did we find out during our um, study? We wanted to uh, ask people what kind of software they use, what kind of problems they have working with software, and what they want to improve uh, with uh, their study, um, their visualization experience. Uh, so here you can see uh, two things. First of all, uh, eight ways to visualize EG, uh, EG data. So you can see that there are plenty of ways to do that. But uh, currently uh, there are no uh, software which is uh, aimed to visualize ERP. Most of them are analytical tools. So uh, currently there exist almost 30 analytical tools for EG visualization. And here you can see is the most popular one according to our study. So here we can um, find three groups. First of all, uh, MATLAB based tools, they are most popular. Uh, you can see that in the upper uh, field. Uh, this, on, the second, um, on the second level would be ME, which is Python based tool. And the third one is a commercial uh, software called Brain Vision Analyzer. So all these three uh, groups are the most popular among uh, our participants. You can find that there is not Julia yet, but we think, uh, because actually nothing is done here uh, almost, but we see here a great um, room to create a new library, which would be specifically focused on the visualization of uh, EG data, not just analysis. Uh, what did we do later in our uh, survey? We asked participants uh, what kind of features they would like, uh, um, what, what kind of features they think are important for uh, EG visualization tool. We presented them with eight different features and here you can find that uh, these four are the most popular. Uh, here on the axis uh, scale, you can see the density of, uh, on x-axis, you can see density of Likert uh, scores. So minus two is not important at all, and two is very important. So here you can see that four uh, features are the most popular among practitioners, like uh, publication-ready plots, reproducibility, speed, and interactivity. While uh, with these two features, uh, they are not so popular. Uh, so you can see that the peak is on one. Uh, so the less important, it's zooming and uh, speed of plotting. With these three features, uh, situation is much more complex. So we can see, what, for instance, for subplotting, some people think that it's not so important, so neutral, and other people think that's very important, it's two. Uh, while um, with Interactive data selection, for instance, we have several electrodes and we have a slider or menu to choose between them. So uh, people are pretty neutral on that, but there are uh, some bunch of people who are really don't like this feature. And we clearly see that uh, plotting by clicking is the least important feature for people. So they actually don't like to click uh, through the GUI to create, uh, to generate a new figure. Okay, uh, later we ask them about the plotting problem, uh, specifically for, uh, generate, for generating, uh, okay, as I said, there are eight different ways of generating plot, for, so we ask uh, for each of them particularly. So you can see here a line plot, which is the most popular among practitioners. They, well, almost all of them had experience of plotting this plot. And what we see here, that almost 30 participants among all uh, who ever created these plots uh, have a difficulty with uh, adding uncertainty. And that's true, we uh, also tried in our experience to create uh, error bars uh, or error ribbons, and that's extremely hard in actually any language to create them. So here is a uh, great potential for improvement of user experience. Knowing this information, we can make their life easier. 
Uh, what else? Uh, except this thing, we also asked our participants about two important things, uh, about their awareness of, about some uh, visualization problems. So uh, here we ask them about uh, their awareness about problems of color maps. Uh, so, you know, uh, not all color maps are good uh, for uh, scientific information. Uh, so here you can see the maybe famous example of EEG lab where uh, there is a so-called JET color map as default. This color map is bad because uh, it creates structure where is no structure. Uh, for instance, you can see with a uh, circle, uh, with a, with a left uh, plot where you can see a lot of ribbons, they actually don't exist. The data is pretty uh, uniform. So it creates uh, non-existing things. Uh, so we ask our participants, do they know about such possible problems with color bars? And 40% say that they don't know anything about any controversies with color bars. Is it good? Probably it's bad. Uh, but at least now uh, we have this sobering information. Uh, what else do we ask them? We ask about such things as 2D color bars. Uh, previously, we were talking about bad things. Now we're talking about good things, uh, possibly good. This is quite useful uh, way of visualization where you can show two different bits of information together. For instance, you can show the, for instance, I don't know, um, correlation or association on uh, the uh, x-axis while on the y-axis you can show uh, you can show uh, um, for instance uncertainty using transparency so they're quite good and we ask how many participants know about them and we see that almost 70 participants uh, are aware about them and on the second question we ask them uh, do they want to use them and we see that um, almost all who knows about such uh, 2D color maps are willing to use them. So uh, that's good, but do any do any software or a tool have them? Actually, not all of them. But so we still have a room for improvement in our future to a uh, package. Yeah, that could be a feature in Maki also. That's it for my part. Uh, we will uh, we will tell you about updates about our uh, tool. But now I give. Uh, my, uh, I should have mine soon. Oh. It's it's not on. Oh, yeah. It's up the end, so. uh, yeah, thanks, Vladimir. Um, and maybe there's a Maki survey coming along or something we would be happy to hear about <clears throat> to do it. But let's first uh, discuss a little bit what we actually were doing in uh, um, with EG and Maki and there several uh, examples here. So the, one of the, like uh, uh, we developed this unfold toolbox, or actually back then it was still in MATLAB, now we are completely translated to Julia. Um, uh, it's quite nice, but often we were like stuck, oh, okay, we, so we need to visualize things. Um, and I was always repeating the same uh, algebra of graphics uh, figures. So now we have quite a bunch of, uh, we have like a zoo of different plots, um, uh, most of those that you saw uh, on the slides before. So Maki allows you to do really cool things uh, automatically, like even uh, with some uh, relative um, uh, access and boundary box uh, issues solved. Uh, allows you to plot plots, top, um, plots in circular menu and all these kind of things. Um, and I think we have solid, some solid defaults to make it uh, nice and uh, visually. But I do think uh, this whole toolbox now that we have a set of things just needs a big overhaul. And um, maybe in the five minutes or so, uh, a little bit more details of what I would need to know how to make it a better toolbox. Uh, how to reuse it. Other things that we were developing uh, with Simon and uh, Philip was is this uh, topo plots. Basically what it allows you, you have some random grid uh, placement, There's dots that are ran uh, like on an irregular grid and have some a certain value and you want to uh, visualize those. So similarly, or electrodes, but it's used in, in many different fields. And you have some kind of interpolators. In this case, this is uh, like a, a so I think it, mm, oh, I don't think, uh, I know the algorithm name, but it doesn't help. But typically it's some kind of spline uh, um, interpolation that you're using. 
and we can use it like this, or we could use it here immediately as uh, uh, for EG visualization. This in the in the backend, the default interpolator right now uses SciPy, um, uh, the flaw daughter uh, implementation of the interpolation. Uh, I looked at the algorithm; it's somewhere like uh, it in C, then, so it's not actually in Python. Of course, it's SciPy, and uh, uh, yeah, I can't do it. So if somebody is into uh, interpolation schemes and making them fast and really, I'd be super happy to uh, help implementing something like that. Just make these plots even faster. There are some few Maki uh, things that are super fast, uh, but they are more like linear interpolation than much more. Into that, if somebody out there, uh, I'd be super happy to discuss. Um, we also had our first. Um, uh, steps into making some of the visualization interactive, like just trying out observables, like learning how observable works uh, for us without any background in, in visualization. So it was uh, a little bit daunting at first, but now I think we kind of have it <laughs> a little bit better. Uh, but it's very nice. You can do lots of things uh, relatively fast. And uh, one little sneak peek, uh, we just started uh, together with Simon on a project to make make these explorations, like to, to solve this ultimate uh, goal uh, in the beginning, how do we explore this kind of uh, cubes uh, in, a, uh, in a better way? And one way might be to have it uh, interactive, uh, that you can, at least for the exploration uh, stage, you just basically plot the function, uh, like you write down the function and you can click together, but uh, I want this term, I don't want this term, something like this. And this is how it should look like in, in a, um, a mock-up in, in some sense, right? So super fast, super nice, and with JS Surf and uh, uh, WGO Matis. And uh, what we are finally doing, because we're scientists, we will also evaluate this tool. So we will have uh, users come in and we will see how they're using this. Uh, are they actually fast? So is it helpful or not? And important, what's super important for me and also for the users, as you saw, like all of this uh, state, basically, I want to have a, a field down here, which gives you the complete plotting command. Um, that allows you to completely reproduce this figure any, any, any time and you can just put it in your script. So you explore the space and then you save this and you just use it in your Quarto or whatever pipeline uh, that you use for, for science. Uh, okay. This is kind of the state where we are right now. So everybody's super happy. Uh, I'm inviting everybody to help out with lots of things. There are some, uh, some, some other exciting venues that I, where I use Maki in my uh, research. Uh, one of them is uh, what, what I call thesis art. So every uh, bachelor master student so far, doesn't scale, but so far I can do it, uh, gets after they finish their thesis and, and uh, under my supervision, they get, uh, I create a poster out of their work. So the idea is that uh, like how, whoever was ever asked, what did you do in your bachelor thesis? Or I don't know if you ever did a bachelor's or not, probably no one, but if you have a cool looking poster hanging on the wall, somebody might just ask, hey, what's that? <laughs> And then you get the chance to, to discuss it. And also for me, like I like graphics designing also for me to thank you for the students because they did all the, the hard work. And so what is this? Um, this is like a, some kind of uh, visualization of what they did in, in, the, um, in their thesis. So this is actual data that I'm using here. And if now zoom in, you need to squeeze your, squint your eyes a little bit, but you can see that this is actually written by the actual characters, by the text of the, of the thesis itself. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to reuse this. And I'm, I'm doing this since, since many years, I've like now 15, something like that uh, of this uh, around. And uh, this is the first one that's in pure Maki. Uh, um, and that's very nice because uh, like, if you try to do this in ggplot, it typically crashes. If you try to do it in MATLAB, typically crashes. I tried it in Python, several different libraries, typically crashes. If you open this kind of thing in Illustrator, yeah, you know, it typically crashes. Uh, even Acrobat or uh, PDF or so is super slow, right? It, it's really hard to work with it, but in Maki, you can, yeah, you just do it. <laughs> it's just nice. So that's very nice. Uh, there are some other, other examples, this one also in Maki, which is very nice, like super fancy uh, uh, fMRI project here. Uh, or this one also recently. Don't show my students yet, they don't have it yet. I need to make a third one. I tried in RPR Maki, but RPR Maki is really hard. Like text in RPR Maki, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're getting there, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was really hard. Uh, but yeah, you have all these nice uh, uh, visualizations. So if you ever, if some of you supervise students, I highly recommend doing that. They love it. Uh, you will love it because it's it's like work, right? <laughs> so it's, it's very nice. I learned a lot of tricks. Uh, so I wouldn't just stand here if I didn't do that, just because like you learn so much of the fonts. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, uh, other things that I really like to do is like interactive teaching materials. Um, so like, uh, yeah, typically students ask me something and I explain it and 
uh, half a year later, the, another student comes and asks me exactly the same thing. And I think like, oh, well, I should write written it down first time. So I try to make this also for courses, uh, just make it, uh, it's, it's super nice in Bluetooth. It's, it's so easy to do. So I started out with Bluetooth and just put the Cairo Matthias to blotting uh, uh, backend because that's what I know, um, right? Uh, and then at, at some point uh, I had this uh, uh, kind of filter uh, thing and then uh, um, Simon was coming alone and said, oh, it's a little bit slow. <laughs> so, and he just re-implemented this whole thing in uh, JSERP and it was suddenly fast. And I was like, hmm, okay, maybe I have to learn something new. And uh, yeah, actually for, uh, uh, it, it took quite a while to, um, how do I share now a new thing? Can you do this? Let us see. We're not, we're not completely done there. There are still some problems to, like, but somebody asked for, like, is there some, some blue to in, in production? So actually now I have uh, for a paper, I re uh, I've implemented it both in Bluetooth and in JSERF because I couldn't get JSERF run uh, to the uh, date where I had to submit the link. <laughs> but uh, that, it's quite nice because I can just demonstrate how like, what JSERF uh, means uh, for this. So here, this is just some, again, you know, this kind of CSV patterns. And uh, let's say you update the plot, you just simulate new data, right? You can see there's like a considerable lag. It's not, it's not super bad, it's a simple thing, uh, but it can be uh, quite bad. And now, if you look at the same thing here in JSERF, it's much faster, right? From it's like half of the speed or something like that. So I really like it and I want to explore. Um, there's, uh, of course, lots of trade offs, like in Bluetooth developing, it's just it's, it's faster and you can't use as many things as you can do in JSERF. So it's simpler in some sense and it's immediately a little bit beautiful because you can do less things. So uh, that's easy. But I, I, I really like where this is going. And, um, I don't know. And you always looks really fancy, like a warm, really nice. Okay, so I'm I'm very much into that. Uh, can you now see the slides again? No? Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, now, oh, I hope I didn't. Uh, I just wanted to raise some potential. Points of, uh, uh, of improvements. Reference, uh, here. Um, some points of improvements uh, because we have been doing all of these things, but then there are just these this day to day things sometimes, or there's just a feature missing. Like if you put Maki JL docs, you're not actually reaching Maki JL docs. <laughs> like you're reaching, like you used to reach always this weird Julia Hub site, which I have no idea what it is. But not, right now it dropped to number two, so that's very good. But it used to be number one, and I click it, and then I receive this super old school uh, market box, and I can't find anything anymore. And more, I know that this is a problem, but my students they don't, and then they are really annoyed. And this is true for algebra graphics, like you do, you do the algebra graphics facets, and you get this really hard thing. Uh, or if I just googled before, uh, market color bars and the official documentation is only on on five, right? Who scrolls down that far? It's even below the, the code. So that, I think that's a, it's a usability problem. Um, I don't know. I have no idea how to address it. I just thought I'd raise it. Raise it. <laughs> I was just thinking, oh, what, what are all the issues? Uh, practical issues, uh, like like I define new plot and then I really never know it. Should I put, like, do I need to specify for the figure type or for the, for the figure and one type for the axis type? Or what kind of functions do I need to provide? Probably it's written down somewhere, but uh, I, I don't know. And I think the underlying reason is that I simply don't really understand what's the difference between all of these. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, okay, the back ends, yeah, yeah. I understand. There's, uh, there were some initiatives a few days ago. So um, uh, yeah, maybe that's something we could work on this week. Just have a, uh, have a nice overview. Um, so that's great. Uh, then we, uh, I started to uh, do all my ma unfold market stuff. I thought, oh, recipes, this is super nice. I started to do that. And then at some point I was, wait, how do I do a subplot? Like, <laughs> shit. Yes, it's not possible to do a subplot in, 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 in the standard recipe. So okay, it's a little bit uh, uh, important because we have several plots that would need uh, this kind of subplot. Um, and then further, like similar to this, uh, how do you do like your plot style in API? Like if I have an uh, algebra of graphics I, um, uh, plot, I would want the user to be able to modify all these all these kind of things, but I don't necessarily want them to read the algebra of uh, graphics. Um, uh, Documentation fully understand if they fully understand algebra graphics in the first place, then they don't really need that function, right? So how do we how do you expose this kind of how you change a, a plot? Where 
like I, I could do something like this, right, for the figure, for the actor, right, just have many tuples and they're just merged in the same kind of default and this, this kind of stuff, I can do that. But then in algebra of graphics, like where would you put the change in the color map? Does, does it go to palette? Does it go to visual? 50 chance? Yeah. This, maybe after the talk, I know. But uh, yeah, for, for me, it, it's, an, uh, it's a little bit more complex uh, uh, problem of uh, do you how do you specify your default uh, uh, parameters? Do you like uh, group it? Do you just put them all in uh, in one like uh, uh, keyboard argument uh, structure and then hope that there's no same keyword associated twice for two things? Or how, how does it work? Um, I have no idea. And also like how to do this like hierarchical, maybe you have a, a specialized plot of another plot. So how do you uh, use the, the um, uh, how do you specify the, the defaults? That's kind of ask me. So I'm very happy to hear your ideas on that. And then there's uh, several features that I just would like uh, to see. Like we started on some like parallel plots. It was uh, uh, difficult. We have like linked axes for this kind of thing, but I don't know how well it scales. I'm not an expert in parallel plots, but uh, the students complained that it was very hard to do. And uh, like dodging things is for statistics super important. Uh, and we have a like a prototype, let's put it like that, which is an option like a wrapper for different, uh, uh, um, I wanted to say geoms, how, how they're called in Maki, I forget. Like for different block uh, uh, types, so you can dodge scatter or dodge line or something like that, but it has several issues there in, in scaling, so we have to see where this is gonna go. The help, again, greatly appreciated. There is some kind of chittering of plots, uh, like I think it's a random chitter that the rain, uh, rain cloud uh, uh, plots uses. But there are nicer ones like quasi random chittering, which really like which chitters among the, uh, along the density. I think this one, in principle, shouldn't be so hard. Uh, but then I tried twice to look at the code for the chitter of rain cloud plot, and then I was like, oh, okay, maybe at a different time, <laughs> have more time. Uh, yeah. uh, text on path, you saw the th thesis art, not highest priority, but I, uh, yeah, maybe that's actually not super hard uh, to do, but it would be nice if we have that now that the serious clients are in uh, market. Could be much easier. Pretty color bars, yeah. I have no idea how to even start. Uh, really, uh, it's not possible, right? Or is it possible? You don't okay. like to have like a two-dimensional color bar. Yeah, but it, it would need to be like a tuple of. It would need to be a tuple of course, at least. That would be really cool. Okay. Yeah. Oops. I'm working on uh, this thing called ternary color map, where basically you have a triangle. Each corner of the triangle is a color, and you interpolate those. And so you form like a triangle of color. Uh, so you could think like fine. green, red, blue, yeah. right? And in the middle is sort of this brown thing. Yeah. And then if you have a survey with three responses, the proportion of each response determines where on the time you sit. Yeah, so in, in this case, you have a, a in this three, 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 yeah, in that case, I have three variables for a four dimensional, yeah. you know, there's things you have to think about with yeah, perception yeah. No, and all of that, but it's definitely, it's definitely doable. doable. It's okay, not cool. a, it's awesome. Not yeah, we should talk. Yeah. So I think that's that's a very fun thing to do. And finally, like AOG and observables that would be super nice. Maybe it's already possible, but uh, <laughs> it's not, no, but that would be super nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, essentially, this is just some kind of function applied to two input arguments that then leads to some other vector that you then apply to a standard color map, right? I, I'm not sure I understood what you mean. So okay, the, the so input given that you have a given blue color, it doesn't given correspond what? a given blue color. You have a given blue shade in your plot, yes. right? It doesn't correspond to any particular value in the color. It 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 corresponds to like a this is the an color array bar. of values. This is the color bar, right? Yes. Yeah, no, I maybe I don't understand. You need two values to define this color bar. So for me, that's a, maybe I use the term one. But you you can not. actually read the X and Y of your data from the color bar. No, 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 you can't. No, no, you can't. <laughs> okay. But no, no, no. why, why is that? Oh, well, you could, like, like, like I mean, in this, in this case, you can't. Like, there's no fundamental limit. You could use uh, transparency or something. You mean not all the colors here are uniquely identified. Yeah, 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 sure. But that might be true for other color maps as well, right? 
they are like cyclic uh, color bars, or okay, all kind of things. It's not a, yeah, but I know what you mean. Yes, I will choose a different. Yeah, yeah, sure. You can do something like this. Yeah. Like put the middle to black or something. But it, this is also like, this is a little bit of the, the domain application for this. What it tries to do is something probably different than you, that you have in mind. This is a, a big, yeah, we can discuss later. I can show you. But yeah, but it is a 2D color map, right? It's just not uniquely identical. Maybe it's a bad 2D color map. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but this is, I, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah but yeah. it's like I'm not Mackie expert, but it seems it's already doable the way you do because this is a one way mapping. Yeah, but you can't like use color bar. Yeah, you yeah. can. I, I could generate it like a heat map. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's much more effort. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, but it's not usable as a, as a color map, right? right? Like I would like to have just heat map and then just give it, I don't know, have it equals instead or imaginary numbers or whatever for Yeah, I just want to use oh I have I have no idea. Like you could you could add uh, you could you could have a special uh, like you could provide two matrices that maybe easier or something, right? No, I don't I, I'm sure it's doable, right? It's, is it easily doable for, like, if I give it to a student? Uh, then that's a whole, you know, whole point. Okay, uh, and with that, yeah, um, I'm at the end. Thank you. Um, enjoy the brains, and uh, I don't know, and thanks for listening. And I think we have to, uh, we might have more questions um, on other topics than 2D color maps, please. <laughs>